Hey guys and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review. Today's game up on the tabletop is Davy Jones's Locker, The Kraken Wakes by Pudcat Games. This is a 1-5 to five player game that takes roughly about 30 minutes per player and is for ages 14 and up. And in the game Davy Jones's Locker, you are going to be choosing one of the famous ships, the pirate ships, um, the Nautilus or perhaps the Sea Dragon. You'll be placing it on one of your starting ports and then you're going to be moving across the sea. Whether it be to search for treasure galleons, shipwrecks, making certain market be benefits from the different locations around the board, or whether it be to explore the different areas. You can also go into the open waters and find certain treasures and pirate areas. You can go to the smuggler's den, and you're doing basically the entire game just trying to upgrade and uh, make better your ship. Why, you ask? Well, because this is just the first portion of the game. There are actually two portions of this game. Act 1 do stuff to make your ship better. Act two, the Kraken awakes. When the Kraken awakes, you are going to need to have your best outfitted ship you could have possibly had before it was time to start the act, and then you're going to fight the Kraken off. The Kraken will reveal himself, his tentacles will sprout based on the number of players, and you'll be fighting not only the tentacles, but the Kraken itself. If you can defeat the Kraken, the game will end, and you'll tally up your infamy. Whoever has the most is the winner. This is a semi-cooperative, uh, where you're kind of like working together at a certain point, but at the very end, you want all the glory for yourself. We'll talk about the basic idea of setup and how to play. I'll probably miss a few things. There's a lot you can do in this game. And then I'll tell you my review for the game Davy Jones's Locker. Let's go. So the basic concept for setting up the game Davy Jones' Locker is you're going to set the game board down within reach of all players, make sure that the Smuggler's Den is the side that you are looking at, not the water side, and place it, and each player who's playing the game will choose a color ship. And then they're going to place their ship in their starting area. If you are red, you will place it in Remedy Cove. If you are purple, you're going to be placing it on Shipwreck's Reef. Green is Siren's Grotto, and then so on and so forth. The only other character that's unique to this is the blue blue ship. The blue ship can actually start in any port, so when you're playing with a five player game, one ship is going to share a port with another ship's location. Go ahead on the board and place down these little shipwrecks. These are going to go on the north and south side of the game board, literally on the north and south game spots. You'll see it, you won't miss it. And then your board is set up, that's it. <laughs> Except for, there's a few other things. Uh, there are a ton of decks in this game. When you set your decks up, it's pretty simple. You have the grotto, the cove, you have the bay, and then you have the reef. Each of those uh, locations has two decks, a market and an explore deck. Shuffle them up, place them next to the locations, and make sure that they're separated. You have a whirlpool deck, you'll have 10 of those. You'll shuffle those up and place them down, removing the extras. You have an event deck, which you'll shuffle up as well. You're going to have an open sea deck, which is going to need to be set up specifically based on the number of players you're playing with. This deck is going to have Kraken cards, and it's going to have open water cards. The open water cards are kind of like event cards. As you travel across the ocean, things will happen, and the Kraken ones are basically the way in which the Kraken will initiate in the game. When three of them pop up eventually, then that's when phase two will begin. There's going to be treasure cards and treasure galleon cards and shipwreck cards you'll place down, as well as flood cards. You're not going to use those all that much, but when you do, they'll be helpful, so place them within reach. Each player, speaking of players, uh, that are on these game boards here are going to get their own player board. A player board will look something like this. On this side of the game board, it's going to have all these different stats, as well as this large placard area. You're going to select a Act 1 power. Now, so if I'm playing this color here, and this character is uh, purple, of course it's got to be the last two on the stack, now, I, I can choose either one of my two Act 1 abilities, and I'll slide that in here. Additionally, each character is going to get a number of little cubes, which will place in the slots that are marked or highlighted for each of the colors. So in this case here, uh, we've got our sailing at three, we've got our um, damage at three, over here is our um, defense at four, and over here is our repair at two. And then we'll have this space. This space has like a skull in it. This is our integrity. Integrity is going to be utilizing this eight-sided die. We always start at eight. That's basically our ship's HP. We'll place it just like that. Everything else you'll need to have in the game is going to be basically you'll have a number of sailors, three of them. You're going to have a number of coins, which is two, and then you're going to have two tokens. One is your explore token and one is your market token. Once you have gained these, then you're basically set for your players, except you might want, if you'd like, to have a infamy board and an act one slash Act 2, Round and Actions cards. These are reference cards that will basically help you along the way as to what you can do on your turn, etc, etc. 
Additionally, you gotta have the Kraken too. So the Kraken's gonna have their own game board, which will start face down. And you're gonna place three black spots on that Kraken board uh, that are gonna be flipped over eventually. They're also gonna have some Kraken tokens and two Kraken cubes that you'll place and set aside because you don't use that for just now. Additionally, there are a bunch of Kraken tentacles and extra dice and extra coins. Just put all that within reach of all players. Everything else pretty much set up and that's basically what you need to do for the game. There are some differences based on the number of players, but for the most part, I think you at least get how it works. Okay, so now I'm gonna explain the game to you. Now, if I get some stuff wrong or key terms, it happens, I'm sorry in advance, but this game's got a lot going for it. Uh, there is a round card, a round order card, and an actions card. You'll need both of these, and these are super helpful, and I love that about this game. The round order is fairly simple. Basically, you're gonna resolve any ongoing events, which means in the event deck, when events come out, sometimes they will stay on the field, and sometimes they will last for a certain period of time, or they're gonna require you to move certain things or do certain things, if there are anything that involve that, you're gonna do it. Almost everything in here is written on the cards. Understanding the cards is reading the cards. Then you're going to draw and resolve a new event card. You'll draw a card from this deck here and you'll read it out loud. Maybe you'll get some water spouts or other pirates or merchants or perhaps some sharks will show up. There's a whole bunch of different things that could happen in this game. It's up for you to decide what, what up to you to see what can be popping up. But basically, there's a bunch of unique events that take place on the high seas. Then, each player is going to resolve their turn. Um, you'll lower any reload counters by one at the beginning of your turn, and you'll choose and make three actions. Now, in the game, when I mean reload counters, I mean uh, there are dice here that are blue, and they have a one, two, and a three on them. And as you get cards, some cards are going to have um, counters that drop, basically. They're kind of like... They're kind of like time counters in Magic the Gathering, where at the beginning of your turn you drop it down and once it hits zero the card is gone. And so that's how you can keep track of maybe some very powerful abilities that just don't last that long. And actions. Well, the other side of the card, or the other section of this other card here, is your actions. And you can do quite a few things. You can take three of them, but in this phase, you can only do one of each of them. Um, you can't sail three times. You have to sail, then you can explore, visit, etc., etc. I'll go through them in order as to what you can do. Number one, you can sail. Move spaces equal to your sail stat. It's gonna be that green, like, you know, steering wheel looking icon. And whatever it says, if this one says four, you can move four spaces. And in general, you're just gonna be moving across the board. Some spaces will count as one space if they're all connected, but each base, basically each pentagon in the area is one space. There are some exceptions to that rule though. So if I'm starting in Siren's Grotto, I can move one space into kind of the reef area, which is all the same space. Then I can move two spaces, and then I can move three and four, and you get the idea. Now, there are trade winds. When you walk into a trade wind, it's one of the windy spaces, you get a free move. If you walk into a trade wind and you wanna keep moving through the trade wind after your free move, you can move two spaces as one move while in the trade winds. And then you can move afterwards, but you're not gonna need bonus spaces. You get one for walking into the first one, and then you can take two as long, you can get move two spaces for one as long as you're in it. But as soon as you move out, it's regular movement once again. Otherwise, everything else as far as movement goes is pretty straightforward and simple. Moving a space is gonna be one on the cost of what you have to pay. Then you have exploring ports. Now there's four main ports in the game. You're gonna have the cove, you're going to have the bay and the reef and the, the, the grotto. And when you go there, you'll take your explore token, you'll place it on the location, which means you can't go back there again. You'll have to move your token to another location if you want to explore this one ever again. And you'll draw an explore card. Reading the card, allows you to understand the card. Do what it says, maybe it's gonna be a stat roll, maybe it's gonna give you something nice, maybe it's gonna be something nasty. Then, um, the next action that you can do is you can visit the market. You can either do one of two things when visiting the market. You'll look at whatever area you're in, whatever port you're in, and you will draw from the market deck. You'll draw three cards, and you can buy one of them. These are typically going to be upgrades for your ship, and each different location is going to give you a benefit for one of the four main, air, main stats that you have, repairing, hull, attack, and sail. If you do not want to draw one of these three, instead you may choose to draw from the discard, or take from the discard pile one card, pay for it, and then attach it to your ship. So you'll have options even as the game moves on. If there's nothing in the deck that you want to pull out or you think that you know what's kind of in the deck already and you see something in the discard you want, you can take that one card instead. That's actually quite nice. Same being said for the uh, Explore token, the Market token will also go 
on the location that you are going and taking the market action. You can't take this action again on your next turn. You can't keep sitting there in the same location going market, market, market until you find what you want. You'll have to go to a new location on the game board to place your market token down or your explore token in order to come back to whatever location it is you want to go to again and you get the items. Hopefully you get something good the first time so you don't need to do that anyway. The next action you can take is you can plunder. You can lower a stat of your choice by one, and it could be your prepare, whole, attack, or sale stat, just dropping down the cube from one space to the next. And if you do that, you're going to be able to draw a two gold market card. You flip it over from the deck, and until you get that one that you want that costs two or less, or from the discard pile. You can also, uh, if you want smuggle if you ever go to the smugglers den there's basically two actions you can take you can kind of smuggle and just gain two gold or you can hire a smuggler for three gold you can spend three gold from the market deck place down a card place your smuggler on top of it and somebody else can take the smuggle action and take that card so you can kind of work together in order to get people what they need uh, you can also trade exchanging market treasures and gold cards uh, to other players in your space you can choose to attack. Attacking is quite simple. With a range of one, you can roll your dice equal to your attack and do damage to an opposing unit's uh, hull damage. Um, the next thing you can do is repair. You can raise a stat or integrity amount by the number of repairs that you have. You have to only choose one though. So if for instance, I have a repair of three and let's say that my uh, attack stat was at one, I could move this back up to two. I couldn't go any farther than the two space because only moving up two, even though I have three. However, with integrity, my top is eight, so if I only had four health left, I could repair the entirety of the amount that I have. So if I go to three, I'd go to six. Um, whereas if I was at seven, I would only go to eight regardless, because you can only choose one. There are some cards that allow you to change that though. You can also bolster. You can add basically a bonus to any one of your stats for the next time that you use that stat. It'll give you a bonus pip and when you're dealing with the enemies or whatever card might come along your way for like a, a stat check or whatnot. You can hunt, you can draw a treasure galleon card. Now, the way you do that is you have to find the little, um, there's, there's two main areas on the game board basically, which are shipwrecks and hunts. Uh, these are the shipwrecks and these are the hunts. You'll go to the little like pirate little islands here and you'll stop on that area and you will hunt. You will draw a treasure galleon card. You will read it. You'll go to the location. You will do what it says. And the same is said for exploring a shipwreck. You'll go to the shipwreck location. You'll draw a card. You'll read it and do what it says. When you finish with the card, you're going to re-roll re one of these directional dice, which is going to give you like southwest or northeast or east, and you'll move that marker to the place that you rolled. Now, additionally, you can actually, for both of these things, you can have people help you. If they're within a range of four spaces, you can bring one person to help you. And whatever stat it might ask you to do, like, oh, you need to have a sales stat to, to defeat this challenge, and you happen to have four, and then you recruit me and I have two, you'll gain your four dice and you'll get one of my dice as well, because you always get half rounded down of the player you're bringing in. However, you have to split the benefits or negatives amongst each other. So there's kind of a little bit of pirating as <laughs> this goes along. And both of them work the same way when drawing these cards here. And those are pretty much the main actions in the game. For the most part, you're going to be moving around from port to port, exploring, to going to the market, heading occasionally to the smuggler's den and trying to gain some more gold, or heading over to these different like sunken ships or pirate islands and attempting to do the cards and succeed in them. Some of them are going to be challenging depending on the type of boat that you have. Some of them will be quite easy. It's really a different range of things that you can do. Another thing to note too when you're traveling through open sea, this is something I didn't really explain, but the main way you're going to get Kraken cards is by open sea cards. When moving, you're going to be basically drawing an open sea card. Uh, if you ever end your turn on a space that's in open water, you're going to draw one, or after you've made your, your sail action, you're going to draw one of these guys. And this is how the Krakens are going to be popping up, the little Kraken cards. Now, because of the deck and how it's situated, the first few are never going to be those, but eventually you're going to start seeing them. Um, and you're just going to do what they say. Sometimes it's going to have you make a, a stat roll, sometimes it's going to have you get something beneficial, and sometimes you're just going to get one of these nasty Kraken afflictions, like Harden for example. When you get one, just place it over there on, on the black spot on the Kraken board, and after you've gotten three of them, that will instantly trigger phase two. 
Let's talk about it. Okay, act two now. Well, basically act two works like this. You flip the game board over, you place the Kraken in the middle, and then you're going to be flipping over the Kraken board. The Kraken board is going to summon four tentacles in a two-player game. It's different for all the number of players. You have to look in the rule book for how all the setup goes, but I'll give you the basic idea of it. You will be rolling dice. These like coordinate dice and these numerical dice based on the location, based on the numbers where you'll place your ship. So they can go anywhere between one, two, and three leagues away from the Kraken, which is basically spaces aft the center. And the same will be said for these little tentacles. Each tentacle is numbered, each tentacle has a number of HP, and the Kraken is going to start off with a basic number of HP himself, base number of players, and of course the difficulty. You'll be flipping over these cards here, these are black spot cards, and each of them is also going to be coming with uh, the Open Seas deck of these Kraken cards here, which are going to have unique benefits to the Kraken. You'll be reading through all this stuff, and you'll be checking to see your stats and your uh, everything that you have, and it'll give you modifiers for the Kraken. So the Kraken can get more difficult based on the quality of everyone's ship. So the difficulty kind of ramps based on how well you did in the previous round. So for instance here, we'll look at one black spot, we'll look at one of these Kraken cards. Plus one Kraken, Kraken modifier, max of five, if any player has at least one market card from every single port. Plus one life for the Kraken for each if any player has defeated a raiding or naval ship. Any ship other than the Man of War has their whole stat increased by two or more. So these are ways in which the Kraken can get beefier. Over here the open sea Kraken cards are maybe hardened, right, which I talked about before, or resistance. Plus one pip to all tentacle defense rolls. So a plus one to all the defense rolls of the, of the Kraken. And so based on what happens and what, you know, based on like what cards are going to modify the Kraken and these basic modifiers from this specific, these specific cards that you drew from the Open Seas deck are going to kind of change how the Kraken works. You're also going to get a Whirlpool deck, which are basically 10 cards that are going to determine the rotation of the water because you're actually stuck in kind of a Pirates of the Caribbean, Kraken in the center, whirlpool all around it type of ship battle. It's like an intense battle where things are moving, the tentacles are coming at you, and the Kraken is trying to destroy your ships before you destroy the Kraken. And basically how the round works is by flipping over the act to actions and round structure, you'll read these and you'll do them in order. The round structure is you will draw and resolve a whirlpool card. You'll draw one of these guys here. You will move everything based on the direction and number of the whirlpool and then you'll either pull ships in or out based on which way the arrow is pointing and then you'll read the card and do what the card says and discard the card somewhere face up because you'll be utilizing uh, the whirlpool to determine like how difficult it is to move against the whirlpool uh, etc etc the um, next thing you'll do after the whirlpool is you will have your tent the tentacles move and attack they'll move two spaces they have a range of two they will attack and it states on the main game board of the Kraken, it's attack, it's defense, it's range, and it's move. And they're basically trying to destroy your hull to zero. Now in the base game, if you ever get your hull to one, as opposed to going to zero and dying, you're actually just going to lose one of your stats by minus one. But in this phase of the game, if your hull ever hits zero, you're, you're done. You sink and you're actually going to flip your board over and give a benefit to your allies if they can pick up your stranded sailors. So, after the Kraken tentacles attack and move, then the Kraken is going to attack. You're going to be rolling these dice here uh, based on how much health the Kraken has. And as the Kraken has less health, the more dangerous it gets. But it'll roll and determine which areas on the board is safe and which areas are not. And then players' ships will take damage based on which locations they're in. Um, then players will take their turns. They'll lower any reload counters by one, like you normally would do at the beginning of your previous turns, and you'll choose and make three actions. But in this case, now you can repeat your actions. You can sail more than once, you can attack more than once, and you can attack any of the five targets that you see here. This is obviously a two-player game setup. I have a bunch of extra ships here, but I've got four different tentacles. Here are your actions. You can sail, you can move spaces equal to your stat, if uh, going against the whirlpool, it's going to be halved, and it takes three to leave the eye of the storm, which is the middle area of the game board. You can attack at a range of one. You'll roll your dice and attack either tentacles or the kraken here. You can repair, raising a stat or integrity by your repair amount. You can trade. Basically, if you're in the same space, you can trade gold, market, and treasure cards. And you can also rescue deckhands. Like I said, whenever somebody dies, their ship sinks. You're going to have one of your little sailors pop on the board, as well as like a ship marker and you can rescue them. 
And then you're going to rinse and repeat, drawing a new Whirlpool card, having Tentacles attack, having the Kraken attack, having a chance to uh, basically take your actions, and so on and so forth. Now the Kraken itself, based on the number of players, it's going to be uh, changing how it functions based on the game board here. It has a certain way of targeting when it attacks. Its tentacles will always target the closest ship. There is an attack radius on the Kraken board that explains how much damage it does. The closer you are to it, the more damage it does. And then it's a defense. Hitting the Kraken, you can do so and just reduce its life, but it's going to have a number of defense equal to two plus the number of tentacles. So removing tentacles is going to help you in being able to defeat the Kraken. And obviously they will respawn at certain points based on the cards that you draw and whatnot and life totals, etc, etc. But removing these is very important before you actually go and hit the Kraken. Beware to stay out of the center of the board at the end of your turn, and try and avoid also being pulled into the center. This is a very dangerous fight. This is definitely what I would consider the boss battle to the first days of the game. You are spending most of the game collecting and restoring your ship, trying to do the best you possibly can to outfit it, and then you're going into this phase, and you're simply trying to defeat the tentacles, and then hit the kraken, more tentacles will spawn, and then once again hitting the kraken, defeating tentacles will make the kraken take one damage as well, and uh, hitting the kraken itself will deal damage equal to its, you know, its total health based on the difference of, of pips, which I'll kind of explain in my review how attacking and all that kind of stuff functions when I think about it and all that kind of thing, but this is the second portion of the game. It's very straightforward. You're not using any of these other cards. You're going to, like, take away mostly everything except for the Kraken stuff and your game board, your modifiers, and your cards you're utilizing. And then, if you defeat the Kraken, you win. Uh, certain things are going to give you infamy, whether it be during the first phase or the second phase, and if you have more infamy than anybody else at the end of the game you're going to win you don't want to play with this you don't have to it can be a fully cooperative game and in fact that's how i suggest you play it the first time anyway though that's how you play the game davy jones's locker the kraken wakes let me tell you what i think about it okay so the game well this game is is interesting there's two things that you're kind of focusing on the first thing is the beginning of the game you're trying to make your ship as good as possible helping out your allies but if you're playing with the semi-cooperative variant you are trying to make sure that not only are you doing well um, and your opponents are able to help you defeat the kraken of the game but you need to be doing the most well now, obviously, with just the cooperative nature of the game, it's all about trying to successfully defeat the Kraken, and the Kraken is quite challenging, and especially based on its modifiers and what happens throughout this portion of the game changes a lot of things. But yes, you're basically moving around, you're reaching certain spaces, gathering valuables, going to the market, upgrading your ship, trying to find the best cards for yourself, and also trying to utilize your abilities as best as possible as well. Speaking of abilities, which I didn't talk about too much, but... There are special abilities that you will equip to your specific boat here, and it'll give you useful things. Like you can be the privateer, uh, you could be a smuggler, you can gain specific bonus actions, you can gain um, things that make things cheaper, all kinds of good stuff in this game. And yeah, so you'll be drawing these cards, whether you're going to be exploring and attempting to find unreliable information, or silver-tongued, or take a chalk, or mysterious barrels, and you'll read the card, and it's all flavorful. All the cards have a lot of flavor. Usually they involve making some type of skill check, and skill checks are great. It's very simple. You check your stat on the specific skill, whether it be repairing or whatever. You will then take a number of these pirate dice, and you will roll them, and you will see what happens. Normally, you're going to get one or two pips or zero on each of these dice. If you can usually get six or higher, that's usually probably a success, and you'll get something beneficial. If you roll low, it can be very detrimental to your cost. And that's pretty much how almost all the Explore cards work. The Market, on the other hand, are basically going to be uh, upgrades to your ship with a gold cost on the top upper, hand, upper right hand side. These are going to provide you with different things, depending on where you go. Do you want to upgrade your sails? Then you need to go to the Siren's Grotto, which will give you something like a grappling hook. Activate this at the end of your turn. Oh, this is not sails. This one is, uh, no, this is sails. Uh, choose an ally in your space. If either ship makes a sail action, both move together. And the ships may use each other's stats for rolls. That's actually really, really nice. It's very expensive, though. It's six. And six is probably the most expensive thing in the game, or somewhere in that area. But yeah, each different uh, location, or these ports here, are going to provide you with some type of benefit. The smugglers area is going to give you certain ways to gain unique items with other players, or you're going to be able to get money, or if you're playing as the smuggler, you can get lots of money. And like, 
the character's abilities that you have to begin with will transfer to the next round and kind of benefit you based on how well you used your character's identity. As a smuggler, getting a lot of money is important, and when you move into the second phase of the game, if you have lots of money, you can utilize them for bonus actions, whether it gives you bonus attack or dice or allowing you to help your opponents, etc., etc. Having that money makes a big difference. The game's first phase is actually quite short. It's not, a, it's not it's like a super, super long game, actually. You're going to go through this um, open sea deck, and every time you basically move once a turn, you'll draw one of these guys, or if you're out in open water, you'll draw one, and you'll read and see what it does, or if it's a Kraken card, you'll just throw it over on a black spot. And eventually, when you'll get three of those, the phases will instantly change. And you actually kind of want to be careful about changing phases so quickly, because you will kind of want to bolster your ship. But on the other hand, if you guys are all boosted, it's very likely the Kraken's going to get a ton of bonuses. There's, he's going to get a ton of like passive and active abilities that they, he can utilize, and the game just gets more challenging in that way. So even if you're all suited out, you can still kind of be in deadly trouble. I like the idea of going to shipwrecks and finding unique treasures and being able to work with your fellow pirate compatriots, being able to kind of bring them along into different locations, whether it be the pirate's island and making them yourself go on an adventure. I mean, there's certain rules with like, when you have to go certain places, you'll be drawing extra open uh, open sea cards and there's certain areas in the map you need to hit in order to reach those areas. Or with the ships, uh, you could have a negative in which both of you are gonna have to suffer that type of a negative. There's a lot of cards in this game that you may or may not use, and because of that, there is a ton of replayability. It's very likely you're not gonna get through a single deck in at least a few games. Um, and even if you do, you're never gonna get the same combination of ships twice. Okay, quality of the game. This game is exceptional in quality. It's one of the best pirate games as far as quality goes I have ever seen. There are metal tokens, there are wonderful wooden dice, uh, there are the countdown and roll dice, which are all made out of the um, pol uh, plastic, that's, this is a, what's, I can't remember what it's called, poly resin or whatever. Um, all of the miniatures are high quality, really beautiful, well designed, and extremely like intricate pieces. Uh, your pieces that you're using for your boat are nice and easy and simple. There is double thickness on your player boards. There is unique little functions, which the game doesn't need to do, and they just did to make it even cooler, where when you flip over your ship, you're actually going to be able to help your allies when they rescue you uh, in the second phase of the game. And there's this whole extra little thing that you don't even think about um, uh, uh, in a normal game. Like, usually the back is, if I'm happy, if there's just at least art on the back of some of my boards. In this case, it's actually functional in the game. But yes, artwork is solid. Quality is solid. Maybe the cards are a little thinner than I would like, but it's such a minor thing and you don't really use them that often. Like you're just placing them down as upgrades. So I don't really see a negative to it. Um, I also like that this game it plays up to five players and it kind of regulates its difficulty based on the number of players. It's also a game of chance. This game you can draw cards and roll dice and miserably fail and your ship's going to be kind of poopy. However, like the game makes up for it, where if you got a bunch of poopy ships against the Kraken, the Kraken's going to be its weakest poopy self, which is still a menace. And it's still very dangerous and can reduce your hold to zero and sink you. Um, but it's at least fair in that way. Uh, yes, there's going to be some what I call like bad moments where you can draw multiple cards, get to mo multiple places, and just fail, 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 fail. That's possible, just how dice roll. So if you're not a big fan of like dice rolling games that have this amount of luck that you can simply just not get what you need, then this is probably a pass. Like, it's pretty simple. Like, there are feel-bad moments that can happen, and you have to be able to accept those moments in this game, just like there are tons of feel-good moments as well. Defeating these tentacles and being able to reduce the Kraken's health feels good. Gathering items and upgrading your ship, improving it feels good. Being able to push it past its limits and making the super strong battleship, maybe even at the cost of your allies, feels kind of good. And being able to use the different types of actions that you have based on your specific objective or whatever person you are, whether you're like, um, oh, I don't know. There's, there's a ton of different classes in here. Um, Apex Predator, or Raider, Pirate's Luck, No Prey, Speed Burst, Lay on Hand. Um, the, my favorite's the Smuggler, obviously. I like, I like the idea of getting all this gold, and then if I have it, I can utilize it. But yeah, they, there's multiple like choices that you have, and then they have a second flip that flips over based on the main game board. 
Um, uh, the way dice in combat works is very simple. You check the numbers, you both roll. Whoever has the most pips does damage based on the least pips. So five and three, five minus three equals two, two damage. And that's simply how it works. And with this idea of integrity, where you can basically lose points, you're never gonna lose in this first phase of the game. And even in the second phase, when you're kind of out, you're still able to help your allies is great. There's no like player elimination. You always feel like you're a part of the game. It's got this randomness that feels good when you, when you get something that's really lucky and it feels bad when you don't. And there's all these ups and downs that this game takes up until the pirates have to deal with the Kraken. And then it's just intense. You have to make all these really smart decisions. The game's luck factor is removed quite a bit and it's mainly focused on where you choose to make placements and how you choose to fight and who has the best like fighting and you might have even trade with other pirate ships to kind of make them bolstered so they can defeat certain things it just has this kind of weird twist to it that i really really like um, overall, this game is a lot of fun. There's a ton of stuff that goes into it. There's quite a bit of setup. There's tons of cards, tons of decks, and there's two different setup phases. So this is gonna be a positive or a negative to you, it depends on who you are. But overall, this is a solid, solid pirate game. If you're looking for something like this, The Adventures in the High Seas with a great story element, then this is what I would suggest you take a look at. Davy Jones Locker, The Kraken Wakes. Link down below. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Davy Jones. Like I said, you know where to go and check out the game. You can also, if you're feeling inclined, if you're feeling generous and specifically um, merciful, you can subscribe. Hit that subscribe button and if you'd like the bell notification button, we put out new videos all the time and we're showing you guys all types of games. Um, and we do a live stream every Sunday at 6.30 p.m. PST where we play games just like this one here. All right, guys, that's pretty much all I got for you. It's still burning heck here in my house because it's during the summer and I'm melting, so I'm gonna go. I I I'll see ya. Guys, next time.